Now, the sermon today, I have to give recognition to Dave Harris about it. Because Dave Harris gave a sermon some time back, I believe several months ago, which unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, never made it on the internet. We couldn't post it in audio or video form and format. And so I did talk to Mr. Harris about it, and I said, well, you know, it's, it's too bad that we couldn't do this because I thought it was a great sermon. And maybe you want to, do, uh, want to give it again. But I said, it's kind of funny because I was thinking along the same lines recently and prepared one. And he said, oh, no, 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 I want you to give it. I don't want you to give it. So you give it, and I will, but it's leaning quite heavily on comments Mr. Harris made, so I want to make this recognition and want to give him the um, appreciation for this work. In other words, it's kind of a collaboration, more or less, between what he said and what I'm going to say. And I will be talking about spiritual growth in God's church. I'd like to discuss today individual and collective spiritual growth in the church of God. And we should see how all of that goes together. Let's start with individual growth. Do you want to grow individually in God's church? Now, I'd like to point out a few things which might not be all that obvious at first sight. But individual growth requires, and if you want to go by points, that would be point number one, to be faithful or to be loyal in very little. In what is least. Now, in Luke chapter 19, you find this very much expressed by Jesus Christ. Luke 19, beginning in verse 15. Luke 19, and in verse 15. And so it was, when he returned, and of course he's talking about this parable where the king goes to a far country and then comes back. So when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So this is talking about an accounting. And we read in God's words that everyone will have to appear before Christ to give an account. And so here we are reading about this accounting. Verse 16. Then came the first, saying, Master, your minna has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little. Have authority over ten cities. It was very little what the man had done but he was greatly rewarded. And there is a connection between being faithful in very little and being rewarded in a great way. Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 10. Because here is what Christ is saying. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. It's a matter of priorities. If you think that you can serve mammon and put mammon on top of serving God, Christ says, you are not faithful. And you will not receive those precious gifts, these precious rewards we were talking about. So we have to be faithful in what is least, in the very little. 
And that includes the least of God's commandments. Notice this in Matthew chapter 5. And ask yourself the question, what is the least commandment in your mind when it comes to God's commandments? What is not that important in your mind? Matthew 5, verse 17. Christ says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he won't even be there. He will be looked upon by others as the least. But whoever does and teaches them, teaches what? The least of these commandments, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So you see the connection between least and great? So what is the least of the commandments in your mind? Now he's talking about, of course, the spiritual law. He's not talking about rituals. These were in fact fulfilled in the sense that through the sacrifice of Christ, they are no longer binding for us today. He fulfilled them in that way. But not when it comes to the spiritual law. That is still in force and effect and will be. Will be. Until there are no more human beings. Until everyone is either a God being or has been destroyed in the lake of fire. Now, what is the least of the commandments in your mind? Is it lying? Oh, well, everybody lies a little. I've heard that stated to me by a minister, about another minister, trying to defend his lies. Is it using foul language? Oh, that's not that important. Is it stealing? Oh, well, I can just take this little piece of whatever. It's not that important. Now, you you think in your own mind, what's least in your mind of God's commandments? And you think you can break those? Well, putting it all together, what we talked about, if you are not faithful in what is least, you're not going to be faithful in what is great either. And that includes even our very thoughts. Not just the actions, not just the words, not just what we say, not just what we do. Also what we allow our minds to entertain. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Because as we all know, thoughts will lead to words and actions. Second Corinthians chapter 10. And notice verse 5. We are supposed to cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now, there must be other alternatives, right? Like we heard in the announcements. Oh, of course, even somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus can still go to heaven when he dies, right? Bringing every thought, every thought, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought, even the very least of our thoughts, needs to be put into captivity to the obedience of Christ. See, we have to develop the mind which God has. We have to become perfect even in our thought process as God is perfect. Now pretty soon, not that long away, we are going to keep the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. And it's not too early to think about how leaven is symbolized in the Bible. And there are many warnings about leaven. And when it comes to the days of unleavened bread, we understand that there, in that context, leaven is used as a symbol for sin. Now, the other passages, as we will read them later, where leaven is used for righteousness. But here we are talking about sin when it comes to days to the days of unleavened bread. And now notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 
how Paul is warning the brethren in Corinth to be very careful with what they might look at the least. Because obviously that is a temptation. Ah, oh, that's just little, that's just unimportant, that I can do or don't have to do. First Corinthians 5 and verse 6. Your glorying is not good, he says. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Now he is talking about some problems in the church, and rather than taking care of the problem, the people even not only tolerated it, but they gloried about it. Oh, look how liberal, how are we free, how, you know, detached from these strict rules. And it caused all kinds of upheaval in the church. Like we used to say, and I've been saying it quite a bit in German, a rotten apple will affect the entire basket of apples. If that rotten apple is not going to be taken out quick. And this is exactly the true case with leaven. Here's what Paul is saying, verse 7. Therefore purge out the old leaven. Completely take it away, he says, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. Now, of course, they were not unleavened spiritually, just the opposite. They were keeping the days of unleavened bread. Another proof that the days of unleavened bread were kept by the New Testament church. So they were physically unleavened, but not spiritually. And so this is what his point is. He says, For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, the feast of unleavened bread, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So he's talking about four things here. We shouldn't keep the feast with the leaven of malice. Now, malice means a wicked, selfish attitude towards other people. An ill will and desire to injure other people. Then you have wickedness. Now that means the active exercise of malice. In other words, putting wicked attitudes into action. Now, this is not the way we should be living, but we should be living with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Sincerity is the opposite to hypocrisy, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then there is truth. It's a lifestyle without guile. But the point is, just a little of that leaven is enough to affect the entire body, the body of the church and our own individual being. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. Here Paul is saying, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, he says it again, in this context. Here again, truth is mentioned. They were obeying the truth. But then leaven came, a little leaven came, and truth was no longer the predominant attribute which they obeyed and followed. And somebody persuaded them from not having to obey the truth. Now notice Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, let's read beginning in verse 5. And when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. And then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we, haven't, we have taken no bread. But when Jesus perceived it, he said to them, You of little faith. Now that faith should have been much stronger than just little. You of little faith, 
Why do you reason among yourselves because you have bought no bread or brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up, nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you do not understand that I didn't speak to you concerning bread, but you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? And then they understood that he didn't tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The doctrine, the teaching. We'll see in a moment what that teaching was. But first notice a parallel passage in Mark chapter 8, because there he adds something. Mark chapter 8 and verse 15. He charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, or the Herodians. Mark 8, 15. So now we have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. But as we will see, he doesn't even stop there. But let's talk about what is that leaven of the Pharisees, that doctrine of the Pharisees. What in particular? Well, Luke chapter 12 gives us the answer. Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. But notice the context, a little leaven is already dangerous. You have to avoid that, just a little, because otherwise we are not faithful in the little, and then we won't be faithful in much. Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together, all they all loved him, they all liked to hear what he had to say, most of them were not willing to do what he told them, though. But there was this innumerable multitude of people. They had gathered together so that they trampled one another. And he began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? What is a hypocrite? Well, it's an actor. A stage player, if you please. Now, he's not attacking actors here. He's not attacking theaters. He's not saying, oh, you should never go to a theater to watch an actor play. No, but he is making a comparison here. See, as an actor is playing a role, he is not that person he is portraying. Now, if he is portraying a bad person, hopefully he's not a bad person in real life. In most cases, unfortunately, actors portray good people, but they are not necessarily good people in real life. Right? That's a comparison. So he's saying, look, it's like an actor who pretends to have virtues which he or she doesn't have. And that is the leaven, the teaching, the doctrine of the Pharisees, pretending to be something they are not. And there are many examples in the Bible where Christ makes this point very, very strongly. Matthew chapter 6. And again, I say, it has to do with even a little. Even a little. Because that leaven will grow if it's not purged out. Matthew 6, verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Okay, you're doing good works, great. You're doing good works so that you can see by others, not that great, not that great. If you as a church are engaged in charitable good deeds so that you can get great praise from the world, not that good. Look what it says. You have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. Here we go again. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory for men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have had their reward, but not from God. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, lest your charitable deed may be in secret, 
in secret. And your father who sees in secret, he will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their rewards. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in the secret will reward you openly. And there are more examples he gave, but let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, and let's look at verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So now he adds the scribes, so he's not leaving anybody out. So we have Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, scribes. He says, you hypocrites, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, and therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and common and have neglected the weightier matters of the law justice and mercy and faith. This you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Another scripture proving that tithing was still something which people were expected to do, but they had to have the right attitude and they had to have the right picture. See, the Pharisees were so diligent when it comes to tithing, they were actually counting literally the common and the mint and the anise, making sure that they wouldn't give one piece too little, but also that they wouldn't give one piece too much. But in doing this, they forgot the radiant matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faith. And in the parallel scripture in Luke, chapter 11, verse 42, the love of God is also mentioned. They were hypocrites. You know, they did this to be seen by men, but they forgot, quote-unquote, what really counted. Not that tithing was no longer required, most certainly was, but it had to be done with the right motive. It had to be done in the right package. Notice verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside, they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Again, parallel scripture in Luke, chapter 11, verse 39. Greed and wickedness. They are full of greed and wickedness. Let's look at verse 27. Now, if you ever have a good explanation and definition of hypocrisy, here it is. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. And even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Well, in saying these words, Christ most certainly didn't make many friends, do you think? No, he wasn't afraid to say those words because they were necessary and needful. And of course, we need to learn from it. We have to make sure that we are not in any way falling in this kind of a category. And remember now, a little leaven, just a little leaven, leavens a whole lump because leaven grows. It grows individually, and it grows in the church. And it has to be purged out before it goes too far. In order to grow spiritually as an individual, we have to behave as a Christian at all times and towards even the least of our brethren. Whoever in our mind may be the least 
Are we behaving towards that person as a true Christian, or are we willing to ignore them, perhaps? I don't want to be in his or her company. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31. Matthew 5, 25, rather, verse 31. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And then the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Now, he's not talking about we have to go out in all the world and doing all kinds of good works to just about everybody we see. That's not the purpose of the church. He's talking about the least of these my brethren. Then you did it to me. And then, of course, he tells the others, Now you depart from me, verse 41. You cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Because he says, I was hungry and you didn't feed me, and so on. And then they ask the same question, when did we ever see you hungry and didn't feed you? Verse 45. He will answer them, saying, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of these least of these, the concept again, my brethren, you didn't do it to me. Verse 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment. Talking about the third resurrection. Talking about everlasting punishment. Not punishing, but punishment. In other words, punishment with everlasting consequences. But the righteous will go into eternal life. So the one will die in the lake of fire. The other one will be immortal God beings in the kingdom of God. So to behave as a Christian, even to the least of the brethren, means growing, obviously, in spiritual ways. And if we want to be first, we must be willing to be last. Now, we have read some of these scriptures now in the past, and there is a multiple meaning attached to them. But I like to focus on what I'm talking about today. Let's read Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 33. Let's look at the concept of doing something to the least of the brethren, or being the least of the brethren, and receiving a great reward as a consequence. Notice Mark chapter 9, verse 33. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all, and servant of all. If you desire to be first, you need to be last of all, the least of all. And in this context, look at Mark chapter 10, 
beginning in verse 28. Mark chapter 10 and beginning in verse 28. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. And so Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the Gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Do you see where I'm getting here? There are those who want to be first, but they will be last. And there are those who understand they need to be last here, and they will be first, belong to the first in the kingdom of God. It has a lot to do with our motivation. It has a lot to do with how we live, with what kind of a concept we live. Look at Matthew chapter 20. I have heard ministers, high-ranking ministers in God's church in the past say to a member whom they counseled with, I will always be over you, including in the kingdom of God. Dangerous things to say. Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her son. So they both, it's talking about James and John, the sons of thunder. So they were there too. So they all kind of got together here, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, the mother, because she was obviously the driving force here, what do you wish? And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they, see, they, not just the mother, they said to him, we are able. And so he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. Oh, verse 24. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. What do you think that was? They wanted to be the ones, right? Sitting right and next to Christ on the throne. Verse 25. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus Christ, the greatest, if you please, under God the Father, became a human being, became a servant, to serve and to give his life so that you and I could be in God's kingdom. And so we have to develop the same kind of an attitude which Christ had. We want to be great in the kingdom? Let us be a servant. And I don't care in the church what kind of a position you might have. That's totally immaterial. Jesus Christ had probably the greatest position you can ever think of. He was called a rabbi. He was called you're the master, and you still said, no, I am somebody who wants to serve the others. We have to understand that our strength is small, individually and collectively. Very small, but it must and will grow. Notice Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8. 
Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8. Here Christ talks to the Philadelphia era of God's church and the remnant of those who are still in existence today, even though we are today, that's my strong conviction, in the Laodicea era. But that doesn't mean that every church member has to have the Laodicean attitude. And so to those who are still of the Philadelphia spirit, he is saying, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. Talking about an open door, including an open door to preach the gospel. For you have a little strength, and how true that is. I mean, I don't even care what Church of God organizations you're looking at today. If you compare that with the Worldwide Church of God organization, every single one of the organizations today have little strength. And even the Worldwide Church of God didn't have a great, huge, big strength in comparison with some of the other quote-unquote Christian churches. So he is saying, you have a little strength, but you have kept my words, and you have not denied my name. And so I believe that is absolutely true for us today. We have very little strength. But as long as we are keeping God's word, as long as we are those who are supporting the truth, as long as we don't deny the name of Jesus Christ and what he stands for, God opens doors and no man can shut them. You see, God's church is small today. As we will see, it's a little flock. It begins small. Whatever God begins, it begins small. It never begins big but it's supposed to grow. You know, we have called God's church the kingdom of God in embryo, which is very true, because church members will ultimately be in the kingdom of God. They will be part of the kingdom of God. Today, if you please, God's kingdom even is small if you look at numbers. It only consists of two individuals. God the Father and Jesus Christ. But every converted Christian who has received God's Holy Spirit is a son or a daughter of God the Father, not born yet, but begotten. So we are, in a sense, the kingdom of God in embryo today. will be the kingdom of God in the future when we are born again Christians. And think of the, I would dare to say, millions, if not billions, of members of the kingdom of God in the future. But it begins small. And now notice Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 10. And we have today a job to do, but we only have a little strength. We're only a little flock. And some may feel discouraged by this. Frankly, I'm not. Because look what it says in Zechariah 4 and verse 10. Who has despised the day of small things? And of course, he's talking to Zerubbabel, who was commissioned to build the temple, which had been destroyed. He says, who has despised the day of small things? Now, the Living Bible gives the following interpretation. They say, Do not despise this small beginning, for the eyes of the Lord rejoice to see the work begin. Beautiful rendition. Do not despise this small beginning, for the eyes of the Lord rejoice to see the work begin. The harvest is plentiful as we read, but laborers are few, very few. And so we read in Matthew chapter 9 that we ought to pray to God that he brings more laborers into his harvest. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, 
he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered. See, they were distressed because of all the problems they were having. And they were like sheep having no shepherd. They were going all kinds of places, looking for some guidance, looking for some help, couldn't find any. And so he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Yes, God wants more laborers in his church. He wants that more laborers are added. But you see, just not any laborer. No, the true ones, the right ones, the ones whom he can use, the ones who are submitting to him, the ones who are not compromising with his word, the ones who are not disobedient to his truth, the ones who do not deny the name of Christ. I'm not looking at growth for growth sakes, even when it comes to numbers. You're not looking at quantity. We are looking at quality. And sometimes even quantity may have to be reduced if you're talking about rotten apples so that the true laborers can be protected. But God's church will grow. It will grow in right knowledge. It will grow in understanding. It will grow in holiness. That's the promise. If we don't grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, then something is wrong with us. If we are still maintaining what we might have learned 50 years ago, never growing, never adding, never better understanding things, something wrong with us. Then we are not growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the book of Haggai, chapter 2. Haggai, chapter 2. Just prior to the book of Zechariah we looked at earlier, beginning at verse 1. Haggai 2 and verse 1. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? See, the first temple was destroyed, so they were supposed to build now the second one. And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? People look at the Church of the Eternal God, the Global Church of God in England, Church of God, the Christian Fellowship in Canada. Kirche des Ewigen Gottes in Germany and some other people associating with us in other places. And that's nothing in comparison to the World Church of God. A huge, big church with these great buildings, auditorium, hall of administration, student center, Mayfair, all these buildings. Everything, however, is gone. People come in, take over, sell everything, walk away with the money. It's all gone. And so here we are trying to continue preaching the gospel as much as we can. That's nothing. Look at this small little group. Right? What does God say? Verse 4. Verse four. Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, 
says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Why are you concerned about finances? I have it all. I own it all. I'll give it to you, whatever you need. I have to remind myself about that too, quite a bit. But God promises this. The glory of this latter temple will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Multiple implications are being revealed here. It's talking about a physical temple which is going to be built. And Christ would enter that temple. That's why the glory of the second temple was even more glorious than the first. It also talks about the church, a spiritual temple to which Christ will come back. And obviously that spiritual temple will be much more glorious than any physical temple could ever be. It's also talking about a third temple, which is going to be built before Christ returns. And some deny that, not understanding the Bible. You see, and in all likelihood, it is that temple, which is also then described in the book of Ezekiel, when God comes back and uses what is left after the Gentiles have trampled it underfoot. And so even in that regard, that physical temple will be more glorious. So all these implications are included here. But here is God's admonition. You work, you do what you need to do, and I'll be with you. Don't worry about it. But of course, you know, the reaction when they started building the second temple wasn't that great, was it? Because comparisons were made. Well, that's just nothing, they said. Look at Ezra chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Ezra 3 and verse 8. Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, and the rest of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem, began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. And then Joshua with his sons and brothers, Cadmiel with his sons, the sons of Judah, arose as one to oversee those working on the house of God, the sons of Hanadad with their sons and their brethren the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. And then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, who were old men, who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Why would they weep? Because in comparison to what was being built now, it seemed to be so insignificant to that first temple. But many shouted aloud for joy. So that the people couldn't discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. They all were shouting, but some were shouting because of joy, and others were shouting because they drew comparisons and said, oh, this is like nothing. No, but God had said, you keep working, and hey, I'm going to be with you. Don't get discouraged. And God is telling us today the same thing. You know, the task of the church of God in this day and age, prior to Christ's return, will be finished, will be accomplished. There are no ifs or buts about it. It will be done. It will be done either with us, or without us. But God says it's going to get done. Romans chapter 9. And of course, I hope it's going to be with us because as long as we don't get sidetracked, as long as we don't focus on all the wrong things, 
which in the days of worldwide, after Mr. Armstrong died, began to happen, and people looked all at the wrong things, what they had to do, and forgot to do the most important thing, which is to what? Preach the gospel in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Only then the end will come. Doing good works in Africa, if people want to do that, it is not the commission of the church today. Getting involved in politics is not the commission of the church, period. Romans chapter 9, verse 28. He will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. Because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. You see, Christ said just before he died, I have finished the work. He also, when he was on the cross, just when he died, said, it is finished. Whatever job he had to do, he finished it. Whatever job the church has to do, will be finished. In John chapter 14, notice what Christ is telling us. John chapter 14, and notice verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Christ was not able to do anything on his own. It was God the Father through his Spirit working in him and through him doing the works. He goes on to say in verse 12, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. Because I go to my Father. Think about that. Christ tells us we will do greater works today than he did at his time. Talking about preaching the gospel in all the world, Christ at his time wasn't able to do that. He couldn't have done it. But today the church can and does do it. As long as we don't lose focus. Isaiah chapter 55. But again, it is God the Father and Jesus Christ living in us, working through us, doing it. All the glory goes to them, not to any human being whatsoever. And they are 55, verse 10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I send it. So whatever God pronounces through his servants today will prosper. And you know, we don't need to know how that works. Sometimes we may look at views, and of course we may look at some websites we may find where people are taking, let's say, our material, and so we get a hint perhaps as to how things might work and how many might hear us, but in most cases we'll be totally ignorant about how it's really working, because that's what Christ tells us. Mark chapter 4. The point is, it's working. The point is that Church's work is not in vain. Mark 4, verse 26. He said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night, and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, and he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. 
But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. God's word is not going to come back empty. It is going to produce. We don't need to know how exactly that is going to happen. But at the same time, we also know something else. As many fell away from the truth in earlier times, already at the time of Paul, most certainly at the time after Mr. Armstrong's death, so the Bible tells us clearly that many will still fall away from the truth prior to Christ's return. And I mean many. Many will fall by the wayside. Many will be offended. Many will turn against us. You see, when Christ spoke, he sometimes said things very clearly, very boldly, and people didn't like to hear it at all. Of course, the Pharisees were not happy when he told them what they really were. But sometimes he said things which people couldn't understand, and he knew that they wouldn't be able to understand. And as a consequence, many separated. Many decided not to walk with him any longer. At that time, he was dividing already the shaft from the wheat. We today have to do the same thing. We cannot allow the shaft and the wheat being together to the point where some are going to be influenced in the wrong way. Those who want to believe, those who want to preach racial discrimination, want to get involved in politics, want to get involved in voting for governmental elections, want to get involved in jury duty, want to get involved in military service, want to get involved in preaching anti-Semitism, anti-Americanism, anti-Germanism, anti-anything when it comes to people. They should look for another place. This is not the place where they should be. There are churches out there, including some of those claiming to be in the body of Christ, who would teach things more to their liking. Oh yes, let's go out and let's vote. Let's go out and join the military. Let's go out and serve on the jury. Let's do this, let's do that. It's not that important to preach the gospel anymore. We have to do good works. If that's what you like, that's where you should be. We in this church won't do this. And we will not compromise one iota with it. The point is, the kingdom of God will grow. Because God's people will become part of the kingdom of God. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35. This is the interesting dream which Nebuchadnezzar had, and Daniel explains it to him. And of course, when it comes to the very last revival of the ancient Roman Empire in Europe, this is what's going to happen. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together because you see those ten nations or groups of nations will fight against Christ when he returns and Christ will crush them. They are crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image on its toes became a great mountain and, in time, filled the whole earth. The stone will become a great mountain. Of course, a stone referring to Jesus Christ. He and his government will fill the whole earth. We read in the book of Isaiah, chapter 2 and verse 2, you can look at this later, that it will be established on the top of the mountains and be exalted above the hills and above the hills. People will ultimately submit themselves to the kingdom and the government of God. And notice how this is described in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, and look at verse 6 and 7. Now we are 
living right now in the so-called Christmas season, where people celebrate Christmas, and some even think they celebrate the birth of Christ around this time, even though most really don't seem to care about that one way or the other. And some complain that, you know, people are taking Christ out of Christmas, never realizing that Christ was never in Christmas to begin with, because Christmas is a pagan holiday and always has been one. But here's an interesting scripture which they use sometimes around Christmas time, not really even understanding what that scripture means. And as I said earlier, Christ was most certainly not born on December 25. Not at all. But look what it says, Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Did you get that? The increase of his government, there will be no end. It will start in Jerusalem and will spread from there. And it will grow like everything grows, which God establishes. There will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Yes, God's kingdom, God's government will grow. How will it grow? Notice Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 31. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven, which is another word for the kingdom of God, it's ruled from heaven, not that we are going to go to heaven when we die. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. What is like a mustard seed? The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. Notice, the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs, or for our British listeners, the herbs, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So it has some beneficial meaning for others. If you want to look later at the birds of the air, you might want to look at Daniel 4 and verse 21, where the birds of the air are described as nations or Gentile nations. So they will come and they will nest in its branches, it says. Verse 33. And another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Now, now it's used in a positive sense. Some commentators ridiculously say, oh, this is also talking about sin. That's nonsense. No, here it's talking about a principle. It's like leaven grows. Now, when it comes to the days of unleavened bread, it's used in the context of sin. Here it's talking about in the context of righteousness. It will grow. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till it was all leavened. See, the kingdom of God will be ruling the entire world, ultimately. Now, when it says three measures of meal, in the margin it says it's approximately two pecks in all. That doesn't help me either. But in looking it up, it's talking about four gallons. You know, about four gallons. So it's not an awful lot. So the woman takes the four gallons of leaven and puts it in the lump there, and everything is becoming leavened. And that is exactly how the kingdom of God, as a mustard seed, as a little bit of leaven, will grow. And the point is that you and I are supposed to inherit God's kingdom. We will, talking about numbers, we will grow so much in an unparalleled way when it comes to the kingdom of God. As I said, apparently billions of God beings ultimately will be in the kingdom of God. A little flock starting small, becoming as big as nothing else. Notice Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, 
and verse 32. Do not fear, little flock. Now, if you look at the great, big, huge Christian organizations today, that doesn't apply to them, can't be possibly applying to them. They are not little flocks at all. No, do not fear, little flock, Christ says. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And finally, Daniel chapter 7. Because once we are in God's kingdom, we will be helping others who are not in God's kingdom yet to also reach their potential. Then we will really be servants of those who are in the same boat like we are today. So that they finally understand the truth and live by the truth, become converted, receive God's Holy Spirit, and ultimately will be changed into God beings. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. That is you and me, potentially. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Talking about growth, talking about spiritual growth in your life and in the church, here you have unparalleled growth. But let's make sure that we will be part of it. Let's make sure that we are individually growing spiritually and also that we are doing our part in proclaiming the gospel. The only and most important work on earth today which counts in the eyes of God. Let's not lose sight of that all-important commission. Mm -hmm.